Many of you recognize him as the guy in the top hat or the chief sticker officer. But he's also JFrog's very own head of developer relations. Please welcome Baruch Sadogursky. Hey. Everybody ditched me for the coffee and the restrooms. Seriously, restrooms and me. Well, restrooms, I guess. Okay, so um, welcome again to, to uh, uh, Swamp Up 2018. Um, so far, I think amazing keynotes, amazing stuff. Um, and uh, now we're going to talk about the download liquid software. So um, as um, already mentioned, my name is Baruch. I'm developer advocate and head of developer relations with uh, JFrog at jbaruch on Twitter. I, I'm pretty sure everybody here follow me on Twitter. If there is someone, that will be a good time because I'm hilarious on Twitter. Um, let's talk about the evolution of software and the reasons for it. Um, who is old enough to remember that? Late 1990s, uh, we needed a new version of operation system in our, what it was, Motorola, Nokia phones. We went to the repair shop for them to do it. And then, oh, this is, this I remember very well. Nokia software updater, anyone? <laughs> right, right? That was great. That was a great experience. So that's mid-2000s. Um, we plugged it in and we kind of got our software update there. Um, this is pretty much recent. If you update your operating system on your phone, upgrading to new iOS or Android, this is what you do now. You're like, are you sure you are able to live without your phone for the next 45 minutes? And you're like, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the interesting part is that most of the software on your phone, like apps and stuff, they're this thing. Anyone knows which version of Twitter client their phone runs? I knew, I knew I'll see one hand. I knew it. That was like almost it was staged, but it wasn't. Yeah, one hand. No one knows. Um, and you're lying, Jesse. Um, so um, why, why does it happen? I mean, that's, that's a massive investment in, in everything, getting from what we used to have to what we have now. Giving away the control of upgrades, of updates, of versions, that's a very big shift. And it happened because we, the customers, expect it to happen. And uh, this great um, war between Android and iOS and, and the, the, this drive to get better of the competition, this is exactly what improves everything in our consumer lives, including the how we update our software. That makes sense. I didn't say anything new. But there is another drive. And this is getting back to what John spoke about. Spectre. Spectre is fun. A couple of months ago, you probably all remember, we opened this year with great news about Meltdown and Spectre. Um, that's uh, a vulnerability, two, two types of vulnerabilities that hit almost any, uh, almost every um, CPU architecture that we currently use, um, Intel, AMD, ARM, everything, everything is compromised. Our life is a living hell. People can stall our passwords and, and they don't need anything for it. And Meltdown was the, was the big focus because it was like, oh, look, this JavaScript code can steal all my passwords. But I think that Spectre was much and is much more frightening. Because if you remember, Meltdown was patchable. A Couple of weeks after we got updates for our operating systems, we suffer five to 30% uh, performance hit, but we were safe from Meltdown. Now, Spectre is different. So as I mentioned, most of the CPU architectures are vulnerable. It tricks error-free programs. Now, this is scary shit. I mean, there is no way you can write software and know how to protect this software against Spectre, because Spectre is a pattern of vulnerabilities and new ways to exploit it discovered after your software is already written. Harder to mitigate that meltdown. And this is a nice way to say we cannot prevent it. The only way 
to fight Spectre is with software updates. Preventing specific known exploits. After someone found a new way to exploit your perfectly valid code, and it did what it did for a lot of different software out there, and someone else discovered that it was a Spectre attack, only then we can prevent it by using software updates. And this is a race. Whoever updates their software faster is more protected from this exploit. Now, for me, this is another very, very significant drive for software updates. It's not now, well, my phone is fancier than yours, it updates quickly and transparent. It's like, we discovered a new Spectre exploit. How many hours after the zero day our software will be protected? Because before is not an option. This thing is hard. This thing is hard because software is not what it used to be. It's not just computers anymore, it's everything. Smart light bulbs is what we think when we think about Internet of Things, but things is not only those two things, it's everything. It's the normal computers that we use, it's the servers that we, we have in our data centers, in the cloud, it's the serverless that doesn't have servers. Well, there are servers and that need to be patched as well for uh, pr protecting from vulnerabilities. Spaceships. That's a thing, it is connected, Internet of Things. Stuff is complicated. Now, the updates are complicated so much that even the best of us actually manage to fail spectacularly. Mm, I have a bunch of Google hardware at my home that I love, but something happened last year, a year ago, all my house went offline. I have a bunch of Google Wi-Fi um, equipment. It all went on offline. And we kind of didn't know what, what happened. And then we got an email. That was an email which says, sorry, guys, we pushed an update to your router that reset it to factory settings. Now, now what? You cannot unroll it because you cannot send commands to the router. You cannot fix it with additional patch because you don't, you don't have a connection to the router. So they send an email. Guys, please go ahead and reconnect your router. It's almost like an Albanian virus. You know the Albanian virus? It's an email that says, you are infected with Albanian virus. Please go to your command line and run RM and SRF and delete everything. So this is kind of this kind of patch. You need, you get an email with instructions what you have to do. It's hard. It's so hard that I won't even try to explain how to perform a proper continuous update to you now, because it took us a year, a tremendous effort, and we have another great way to explain you how to do software updates. I present you the Liquid Software Book. and the book's authors. So um, he's a French Israeli who settled down in the Holy Land. He loves science and technology and fell in love with computer coding since the age of 10. Since then, his neurons spend an enormous amount of oxygen and sugar pondering the infinite capabilities of software. He's today helping all his fellow colleagues deliver their creation to the world faster than ever as a chief architect of JFrog, please welcome my co-author, Fred Simon. And also, he is fascinating with making computer do what he wants him to do, even since he laid his hands on the rubber keyboard of ZX Spectrum machine as a kid. That gives away his age, but we won't speak about it. Since then, he has discovered that computers took over his life no less than he did take control over them. While he's not busy with making computers and people live in harmony, he's acting as the CTO of JFrog. 
Please welcome my co-author, Joan Lanman. <laughs> this side. Ah, yes, sir. Well, and you know this guy, the hat and everything. Let's skip to the fun part. Well, yeah, the liquid software book, and, and I would like to take uh, the remaining time uh, between now and lunch to um, ask you guys some questions about the book. And um, first of all, the obvious question is, what's up with the name? What is this liquid software thing? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the name came actually from internal discussion at JFOG about uh, more than two years ago. And uh, we started to uh, look at what we are doing and the, the packages that we are managing. The packages were getting smaller and smaller. Companies were uh, cutting their software into a smaller modular uh, uh, system. And they were delivering more and more version and more and more features uh, faster and faster. And so uh, instead of uh, thinking about software delivery and software storing, which we are doing at uh, JFOG, uh, in terms of uh, packages, uh, we started to think about it in terms of uh, liquid. Because basically the natural progression from smaller and smaller pieces, faster and faster flow, the, the concept of liquid and the concept of liquid software. And, uh, from there on, the analogy uh, stuck, and actually, so the book is uh, liquid software and continuous update, and for example, the concept of continuous update, drinking liquid software <laughs> kind of made sense, and uh, we really like it. We cannot it. see the picture of update drinking software. <laughs> right, now, I, I remember myself when I first heard it from you, this concept of liquid software two years ago, and, and the penny dropped because we break the software to pieces so small and we push the update so frequently, it looks like a stream of, of liquid. Well, um, next question would be, okay, so you have this, this concept of liquid software, but why it is important to think about software in, in that way? Okay, so uh, we are all driven by, uh, by this huge flow and huge pipeline that uh, drives our software updates, and we, we have this uh, all DevOps uh, to, to drive this uh, fly pipeline. Uh, but then we are, uh, when we think about software, we still think about it in old versions, right? So um, I have just here the, uh, oh, good sound. Uh, so this is the original Artifactory 2.0 box. So um, it's, uh, it's protected by a laser and don't try to touch the glass. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, so the glass took it. the heat, so the box won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so th the funny story about it, there was never a, a physical version of Artifactory, right? So, but still the designer, he felt, felt obliged to come up with something tangible that he could, could bring us because he couldn't think about software as something that, uh, that has no version, even as some, somebody who's not doing software. And we are still bound by these concepts till today. Um, and uh, we, we really have to uh, fight this version idea. We, have, we are having this huge pipeline and then we are stuck with releases that are all around version names. So this is something that we are challenging as part of this book. Yeah, uh, yeah and uh, about the, the fight, the fight of comparing software to packages or uh, software to, to liquid. And in, uh, in, in our product and uh, at JFrog, it really, really helps to start to think about software delivery and software distribution in terms of pipe and in terms of connections between the different teams, between the dev and the prod and the staging. And uh, so instead of thinking about putting boxes in trucks and having trucks driving around to connect the different pieces and have this continuous flow of uh, version all so the way to product. The, the term package is, uh, is wrong, we, right? We, got, we, we need to fight the package as well. Right. Um, so you, you talk about pipes, you talk about liquid, you talk about uh, this analogy, and, and uh, I have to ask you, uh, pipelines are with us for, what, 15 years? Since the invention of CI, pipeline has been a concept that we constantly use, a uh, paramount concept of Jenkins, for example. So how the pipes of liquid software are different from pipes of continuous integration, continuous delivery? Yeah, so that well, when um, it's true that the pipeline and continuous integration, taking the code and, and doing this uh, continuous build, started the, the liquid software revolution. Continuous integration started the liquid software uh, integration. But uh, with continuous delivery and continuous deployment, what we are seeing today is still in a lot of uh, staging environment and in a lot of uh, pre-prod and, and, and 
we're seeing a real full new deployment. So a clean slate to make sure that the tests are working perfectly and, and the environment. Uh, a lot of um, uh, um, developers today, they are running it on a clean environment and, and on the clean uh, uh, data. So basically this is not the real world. When it goes to production, you always have a lot of data and you have a lot of user information and you need to do it uh, with the zero downtime and with the continuous. So the actual uh, problem of uh, updating and continuously updating a version is what we should concentrate about because deploying a new services or a new application is something we do once, but updating it is something we do millions of times after. So the goal is to do continuous updates and the goal is to concentrate on how we can update faster a running application with running data and, uh, and take this problem on right from the beginning. That's definitely not how we build the CI pipelines now. Do you say that we need to rethink uh, our approach to immutability? Is it suddenly a bad thing? Well, no, I, I know it, it may sound confusing, but immutable infrastructure is, is not something that we are uh, fighting, but uh, it's more of a conceptual thing. Think about, uh, for example, when you update a Docker image, right? So you always have the, the base layer, and then your updates are differential. So in a way, you have states there, but still many users, for example, they uh, prefer to completely uh, clean up their Docker uh, internal caches because they don't trust it. So it's a, a lot of it is uh, conceptual, and, and it's, um, it's a matter of trusting your infrastructure to allow you to achieve immutability, but an optimized one, right? Yeah, so what you say is that we need to distinguish between immutability as a good thing and stateless, which we don't really have in the real world. Uh, this is all very nice. Uh, liquid software, continuous update, that's a great story. Uh, but it sounds like an utopia to me. What is, what is our validation? How do we know that it can be achieved in the real world? Right, so the, the validation, I think, is the, the business need. I mean, everyone knows that software has direct con contribution to, to the ROI of the company. It's no longer something that is questionable. Everyone is doing software. Everyone is... Uh, believing that software has real value to, to the organization and to what products the organization um, make uh, regardless of what they are. And uh, the need to update software, so uh, also Google mentioned it in their talk, they need to have auto updates, they need to not to think about software updates or to release something in a matter of, uh, of even hours. So today, for example, at, at least in uh, the consumer space, when you, when you do have auto updates, uh, the, the expectations is to get updates in a matter of hours, sometimes even in a matter of minutes. If you can just roll back to an older release, it can take even minutes. Um, and that puts a lot of burden on, on the software vendor. So, so we see the demand. True. Yeah, and uh, like uh, we saw it with Google. They, they really saw uh, Google, Netflix, uh, uh, Yahoo, when we worked with uh, Yahoo at the time. I mean, all the big software vendors today, and especially on, on the cloud, they are doing continuous update and they are managing. But they, they use some proprietary things that are uh, specific to their environment. They are opening it. So uh, uh, Melody talked about uh, 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 Basel, Spinnaker, uh, and Kubernetes, and, and of course- And all Netflix OSS And Netflix OSS platform. So uh, we are starting to see the, the, the benefits of the work uh, and we are starting to use a lot, a lot of automation around it. But the goal is that for any software running on any platform, on any runtime and all the way to, uh, to the devices and to the end users, we need to have this thinking of continuous update for any running piece of software. Uh, and uh, so this needs um, some kind of a thinking and, and, and an exchange in, in the DevOps uh, process. But but we already have shoulders of giants to stand on. The shoulders are there. All we need to do is climb. Joab, <laughs> um, uh, you, you mentioned fighting the version. That's a that's fascinating concept. Wh what does it mean? Well, like I said before, we, we are still bound by the version concepts. And this version, they are, they are there for a reason, right? Because they are checkpoints for having trust uh, and uh, for also bundling certain features together. And we make a big uh, fuss around versions, and we have the, this, this huge uh, uh, release announcement, and, and so on. So there is still uh, a place for versions, but uh, for the for the most part, when we develop, we don't ever think about version. In our, in the Art Factory code base, in many other products that uh, uh, 
uh, or, or even libraries that are done in JFOG. We don't really embed any version uh, except for maybe a major, a major version into the, the, um, the, the pipeline until we have to cast the version. Yeah. So, so, so you say uh, versions, major versions are important as, as checkpoints. Because uh, look at us. We build a whole conference about the version. <laughs> like just um, shh, don't tell anyone, mm -hmm. spoiler alert, Artifactory 6 tomorrow in tomorrow's keynote. <laughs> We have a major version, we have a conference around major version. Right, so uh, <laughs> I don't know, ma <laughs> maybe in, uh, in uh, three, four years when, when we will speak, we will not speak about Artifactory 12, okay? Uh, but still there is a, a big importance to a version which is, it's a, a lot of it is a commercial version, right? Uh, we cannot hide them um, around the bush. It's, uh, it's a revenue stream, it, it still uh, has a point. But like you don't think about what version of Chrome you're running, so it's, it, it's something that's happening. But, uh, but on the other side, we see that, so for example, a couple of months ago, there were all the debate about Java uh, release cadence. If you remember, um, um, uh, going from a year and a half, 18 months, they are now a two, uh, two, to six months. And, and a lot of vendors that uh, obviously rely on Java m mentioned that they are not ready to upgrade and to accept a version every every six months. Sure. So uh, again, it, it's all it all depends, right? So when you're doing software that you don't control the update cycle, so you're you're leaving it up to your users to control whether they can update, and it's not a forced update, which is it's a big question, and we we talk a, a lot about it in the book. Then uh, you cannot. If you, there is a difference between being able to release fast and and actually. Uh, uh, like having the capacity and actually being able to force it on your users, right? Because they always feel, uh, I just updated two weeks ago, the update is a whole ceremony, we are now already up to, uh, out of date. So you also don't want to uh, release, but it's also creating a lot of uh, risk in how you uh, create releases if you wait too much. So here's another challenge. And, but, but aren't we getting better with versions? stuff like Semver, for example. It's been around for, for, for years now, but still, it's kind of how you improve the version and now how you get rid of it. Yeah, so there is a big difference between libraries and when you have an API, which the, where, where the version has still a, a very significant role, and something that doesn't have an API and you just install it and, and run it or like a service or a consumer application. Mm. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, by the way, all this issue of forcing the update, uh, uh, when we thought about it in the book, we, we, we tried to push ourselves and we thought, uh, when will be the time that uh, a pilot in an airplane on flight will update his uh, navigation system? Uh, while driving are, car is another great example. Yeah, or driving the car and updating while the car is driving and all this kind of uh, uh, problematic. And, uh, and we said, okay, no, that will never happen. But at the end of the day, when we, when we think about it, we, we should be able to do it, okay? Uh, we, uh, as human being, manage to update a robot on the surface of uh, a planet, which is... Uh, which is nice. Which, which is, nice. is on, a, on yeah. another planet, and uh, <laughs> so we should be able to, uh, to do those updates and to do those continuous updates. And so it starts with the web, but we, sh we should be able to update an airplane while on flight. Yeah, I think, I think in the book we have this diagram kind of a decision-making matrix on where continuous update can be applied and yeah. where even today we should stay away, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. updating the plans mid-flight. Yeah, so um, but, uh, what was the hardest concept to, to explain? So, yeah, we're, we're a lot of the, um, the, the process of uh, writing this book okay, was, uh, <laughs> was quite fun. Uh, uh, fun it, is it, a nice way to put it. <laughs> it was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how many of you uh, wrote a book, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, quite a painful. And uh, uh, during this process, we uh, had a really nice uh, discussion with uh, Kit Merker. And by the way, the he's, the, he's the main editor uh, of this book. Thank you, Kit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, during the talk, we, uh, we, we tried to, uh, to represent what is the problematic of uh, having a huge microservices uh, application with a, a lot of uh, uh, services talking to each other and how you can update uh, so forward and backward 
um, dependencies for the one calling you and for the one that you are calling, and how can you move forward and how can you move and keep updating all the services uh, continuously. And we find uh, a, a list of nice rules uh, to basically make sure that uh, you keep the zero downtime, so all the requests, even under load, the system keep uh, answering always uh, uh, continuously, and you keep having the ability to move forward and backward. And it looked like a nice little dance, and so we called it the release shuffle. So it's a kind of uh, uh, um, a dance between all the services and the, uh, holding. The shuffle for engineers. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, when we wrote those rules and uh, when we designed this uh, release shuffle, we find out basically that uh, data is hard. Data, data, is, really data is hard <laughs> like not liquid or hard like not easy? Yeah, data is written in stone. Okay, that's not liquid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so data is, is hard. It's hard to update and uh, updating the data layer and uh, updating the, the different schema and, and uh, the documents of your uh, different database is, uh, is a hard process, especially when you have multiple services connected to it. But uh, yeah, we find a really, um, really nice way to think about all those different problems, taking some, some example and, uh, and finding the, the, the good way to, uh, to move forward and, uh, and, and do this job uh, correctly. And we, we hope that uh, you're gonna like it. <laughs> This is cool, um, and and um, I guess you all. Uh, I hope you all wonder when this read this book by now. And and I would love to ask the last question is: so we have this concept, we know where we are going, we have a lot of practical advices of how to do it. But the question is: what's next? What's the next frontier? Right. So this book is written with a very visionary uh, uh, concept in mind, right? Uh, but still it has a lot of practical uh, advices on how to, to actually do things because as JFOG we are actually dealing with tougher problems than many of the uh, big large scale organizations are dealing with just for the reason that we have multiple versions. So uh, the, the large ones they only have one or, or two versions if, or, or maybe three if they use Canary uh, releases. Uh, but when you are not uh, in control over your, your runtime which is coming back uh, big time with IoT uh, the whole update mechanisms be become a lot more challenging because users can move between versions uh, really quickly. So like I said, we wrote it with a visionary uh, and but practical mind. Uh, and as part of it, we uh, and actually during the writing process, we identified uh, four main areas that, uh, that are challenging uh, for us and for customers. So first one is, is what we call overcoming physics. So there is the real world, you still have to take a binary and binaries are getting larger, and you have to move them from point A to point B in a very efficient way. Isn't the internet always available and very, very fast? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is scalability. You want to, to do it on a large scale with many, many endpoints and many, many devices and, and many production sites. Uh, then there is uh, the question of trust, which uh, uh, John really spoke about a lot. Uh, so you, make, you want to make sure that your software is, is, uh, is clean and that nobody tampers with it when it reaches your, your runtime. And the, the, the last one, the fourth point, is the question of visibility. Uh, making sure that you're in charge and you that you're in control over the, ho the whole process. So I think you will hear a lot more about this tomorrow and you will be able to correlate and connect the dots in some of the announcements we will make uh, during tomorrow keynote, tomorrow's keynote and part of the sessions tomorrow. So that's what's next. Yeah, uh, just uh, one point about putting down all those concepts and all those information in, into, into a book. Uh, it was a lot of uh, discussion, internal uh, discussion uh, at JFrog, and uh, uh, basically without Shlomi pushing us and, uh, <laughs> and making sure that we write down, it will never exist in this uh, hardware form that still exists, which Thank is you, for Shlomi. the book. Plus Thank one. you. <laughs> Okay, so I would I would really love to take some questions of, uh, of, from the audience, but we we run out of time. So so maybe maybe just one, uh, maybe oh this handsome dog gentleman, yeah you go ahead. So Boris, this, can you hear me? Uh, just talk louder. So Boris, this is really cool. Uh, there's only one problem: all the bookstores in the area are already out of stock. So how can we get our hands on this blockbuster? <laughs> 
Don't you worry, my dear friend. It was like it's almost so staged, right? <laughs> right? right? So don't don't you worry. Don't you worry. Um, I'll do opera now. You get a book. You get a book. You get a, all of you is going to get a book. <laughs> so during during lunch, which is right now, all three of us, instead of um, eating with you, are going to sit in the um, uh, book signing table by the Jeffrey booth. And you will come there, you will give your small book sticker that you all have on your badge, and you will get a signed copy of uh, Liquid Software. With that, don't move yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before you leave, someone has to do the where is the restroom talk. Yeah, you know where the restrooms are? You can go. Okay. Um, so a couple of house uh, holding items that no one bothered to give, so I will. First of all, Wi-Fi. Um, you probably know, to figured it out by now, there is like a tiny uh, kind of paper in the middle of your table. This is where the Wi-Fi password is. Um, coffee breaks are in this expo, sponsor expo area, the other building. Um, you should go there to drink coffee and to visit our awesome sponsors. Thank you, our sponsors. Swamp Up wouldn't be exist without you. Uh, book signing by the Jeffrey booth, as I mentioned. Um, check out the demos over there. A couple of words about the content. Being the chair of content committee, I cannot skip this part. Um, speakers, please stand up. Come on, come on. You are 40 here. OK, they, or maybe not. Thank you very much. <laughs> Those people are amazing. And right after lunch, we go to breakout sessions for uh, four tracks today, four tracks tomorrow. Cloud native, mostly Kubernetes, obviously. Enterprise great DevOps tools, mostly JFrog tools, but not only. Uh, future of DevOps, um, that's kind of a different kind of conference, but I, we still insisted to put at least some of a visionary and thought leadership talks. Check those out, they're great. Keynote tomorrow, keynote tomorrow, obviously. Metadata, we have a soft spot for metadata in JFrog, so a lot of talks about data and metadata as well. DevSecOps, um, John Willis give, gave us a perfect start. We'll have talks about that as well. Um, IoT, obviously, robots, bots, chatbots, physical, virtual, a lot of this stuff as well. Um, and uh, last but not least, Conan. Shlomi mentioned Conan in his opening uh, remarks. Um, today we are going to have an hour and a half roadmap discussion with the founders of Conan, Diego and Luis, they are here. Tomorrow we have a dedicated track, Conan stuff all day long. If you are into C++ native Conan, please do not uh, miss. So as you saw, the speakers are awesome, the content is awesome. Um, if everything's good, it's thanks to them. If something didn't, it's my fault, and I want to hear about it. So in all the talks, you will have feedback forms lying on the table in the breakout sessions. Please fill them, and we'll collect them, and we will know how to improve. After the breakout, we have the fun part. I don't know what more fun sessions or this, but that's the official fun part. A wine cave reception sponsored by Circle CI in a wine cave I don't, no need to say more. Gala dinner um, back here with a mind-blowing DevOps mentalist, Lior Suchard. I have no idea what I just said. This is what's written. We'll see. I will be surprised for sure. Um, Crash Bar Party is sponsored by Sumo Logic all the way to the night. Do not drink too much because tomorrow, 10 uh, before 9, we are getting back here for uh, tomorrow's keynotes, and they will be amazing. If you have any problem, if you need any help, if something doesn't work, you see something, say something, find people with team on the back, and let us know. And with that, lunch, book signing, sessions, thank you very much.